Hey, so we're so glad that you're checking out this video and our prayer is that it helps those who are far from God become committed followers of Jesus Christ. However, what we don't want is for this video to be a replacement for church. It can't be a replacement for church. We believe that the gathering of believers, being in covenant community with other believers at the local church matters. And what's more is that God designed us to be in community with one another. So we pray that this video serves as a blessing to you, that it helps you, that it encourages you, and even challenges you and brings you closer to Jesus. So again, we're super excited that you're checking out this video and we pray that it's a help to you. Just don't treat this video as a replacement for your church, and I think the Lord will honor that and see your commitment to the local church. Well, good morning, Brainerd Faith family and guests. Uh, let's study the Bible together. Let me ask you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter two. Uh, if you uh, uh, came in and don't have a copy of the Bible, I hope there's someone maybe in your group that has one that will allow you to look on with them uh, while you're finding a place there. me welcome those that are joining us online. Thank you for uh, carving out the time to do this. Hope you have a Bible close by and will join us in Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to read God's Word over you. Matthew is the human author, but he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so this is God's Word to us today, Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And here they quote from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. When Herod secretly summoned, then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship it. After hearing the king, they went on their way and, and there it was, the star they had been had seen at its rising. It, it led them and, uh, until it came and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house, they, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. So who's going to be the next president of the United States? You know, probably the majority of people say that's a settled issue. President-elect Joe Biden has been busy uh, filling his cabinet moving uh, full speed ahead to occupy the Oval Office in January, but there are still others that are saying, well, not so fast, right? This week, uh, country music star John Rich bet a music journalist $10,000 that the Supreme Court would overturn uh, the election results and that President Trump would serve a second term. If you've been following the news, you know that obviously by the end of the week, he lost that bet. He was banking it, of course, on a lawsuit filed by the state of Texas, backed by 17 other states that said that in four states, the elected officials had operated illegally by changing the election process, and therefore uh, the electoral process should be delayed. It should be put on hold. Even though that lawsuit stopped, reality is, regardless of who's in the Oval Office, there will be people who will still disagree about whether that person ought to be there or not, right? And, and that's because uh, th there will always be degrees of disagreement 
about somebody's rightful claim to that particular office. Now, certainly we would agree that uh, the leader of the free world, arguably the most powerful individual on the planet, that's a pretty important thing for us to get settled. But tragically, you understand the same issue is at hand when it comes to the person of Jesus Christ. There will always be people who respond to him differently, who respond with different degrees of obedience, who respond with different degrees of loyalty, who respond with different degrees of agreement on whether or not he should be in the position that he's in, all depending upon how people view his claim on their lives. And I, and I would just say to you this morning, church, that the stakes of the person in the office of God's Savior King carry far more important consequences, are far more higher than even who is president of the United States. And here's the deal, regardless of how you or I may feel about someone's claim to the Oval Office, every single one of us have to wrestle with the issue of the claim of Christ on our lives, every one of us. And the reason is, is because the Bible tells us that he is God's Savior King. And as God's Savior King, he is the only one that is worthy of our allegiance, of our obedience, and of our worship. You see, that's the conflict in this passage of Scripture. It's not about the President of the United States and who ought to be in the Oval Office. It's about the King of our lives. And the degree of obedience and allegiance and agreement we give to his claim. That's what Matthew's doing here. If you were here the last two weeks, you know this as we walk through Matthew chapter 1. Matthew begins by putting a legal document on the table that suggests that Jesus of Nazareth at least had a claim to the throne of Israel because he was of the house and lineage of David. But Matthew didn't stop there. He took it a step further in recording the account of the virgin birth, Jesus' supernatural conception, to indicate that he not only laid claim to the throne of Israel, but he lays claim to the throne of the universe, having been supernaturally born into this world, given the title Emmanuel, God with us. He laid claim to the throne of the universe, and listen to me, come in here real close, the throne of your life and mine. And none of us get a pass. None of us get a pass on wrestling with that issue, even if we don't wrestle with it. We levy a response to it and our acknowledgement or lack thereof that he is the rightful heir to the throne of our lives. And when we come to Matthew chapter 2, what, what we come to is, is, is we come to the rub. We come to the rub of, of the person who lays claim to the throne of your life and my life coming into this world. And what we see in this, to many of you, familiar Christmas story is that rub playing out in various responses that people give to him. And that's what's happening here. What you find in this passage of Scripture is, I think, a representation of three responses, at least. Three responses that people give to the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who comes into the world and lays claim to the throne of their lives. Some people just blatantly out and out reject Jesus, and that's in this passage of Scripture. There are others that would never fess up to rejecting him, but actually they are rejecting him, but they're simply doing it shrouded in embracing a religion that is, that is absent, it is devoid of Jesus. And then there, there are others in this passage of Scripture that, that respond, I think, like God wants us to respond and why he put this passage of Scripture in the Bible. People that respond with reverence for Jesus. They revere him with the worship of their lives because they acknowledge him as the one who has the right 
as God's Savior King to the throne of their lives. So what I want you to do is I want you to look at these responses with me. I want us to study this together, and, and I, want us to, I want us to do what I think God would have us do in putting this passage in the Bible. I want every one of us to, to answer this question this morning. How, how do we respond? How do we respond to this Jesus? So here's the first response, and that's just rejection of Jesus. That, that response, I, I think, is embodied in this passage of Scripture through King Herod. This Herod was one of many Herods uh, that, that was part of the leadership or the reign of the Romans uh, over Israel through the years. But, but this, this is a guy who had a, a particularly bad reputation. He did some, some good things, was known for some good things. He, he was a, a great uh, administrator of public works. Uh, and uh, he also was a pretty shrewd diplomat with both the Jews and the Romans. But, but when, when history looks back on his reign, it pretty much it, it's categorized as a reign of terror. He was a tyrant. He responded to the people that he was supposed to be shepherding and supposed to be a leader of, supposed to be a king over by, by, by doing things uh, like levying unfair taxes, by forcing them into to forced labor. He responded to people with anger and volatility. And, 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 and in that, he, he represents somebody who, who meeting this claim on the throne of Israel, pushed back against that and, and rejected it. Now, most of the time when people reject the Lord Jesus Christ, it plays out in, in, in two ways. One, an attitude and one, an action. They're both represented here. Let me show you the attitude. Attitude is when, for many of us, when Jesus makes claim on our lives to be the Lord of our life, the king over our lives, we are, we are threatened by him. And certainly that was the case with King Herod. These wise guys show up in Jerusalem. Traditionally, there are called three of them because of the gifts later on in the passage, but we don't know that for sure. They, they come knocking on Herod's door and, and, and they're wanting to know, verse two says, in the chapter, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Now, let me give you a little backstory here and then tell you what these guys are asking. The backstory is in 40 BC, the, the Roman uh, government uh, put Herod uh, in the position of the king of the Jews. They, they gave him that title. But the Jewish people never acknowledged him as a rightful heir for a particularly good reason, and that was he wasn't totally Jew. He was half Jew and he was half Edomite. And so in their minds, he was a usurper to the throne. He wasn't there rightfully. He didn't have the qualifications. He wasn't from the house and lineage of David. He was a usurper to the throne. So with that in mind, listen to these guys who in the language of the New Testament in verse 2 actually put the verb has been born in the place of emphasis. In other words, they knock on Herod's door, the king, and they say to him, where is the one who was born to be king? Translated, where, where is the one who ought to be in your position? Where is the one who is the true king? You know, I, I don't know, uh, you know if any of you remember this. I remember a guy saying one time, you know, you know it's going to be a bad day when you wake up in the morning and there's a 60 minutes crew at your door. Things are going to go downhill from there. Well, let me tell you something. You know it's going to be a bad day when you think you're the king and you wake up in the morning and there are three kings standing at your door wanting to know where the real king is. And this threw Herod into a tailspin, understandably so. He thinks he's the king. He wants to be king. These guys show up and say, tell us where the one is, who is who's got the right to claim the throne, who is the, the real king. And so the Bible tells us in verse 3, when King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed. He was agitated. It threw him into a tailspin and all Jerusalem with him, as you kind of might imagine, if he's the tyrant that history says he is, anytime the king gets upset, it goes bad for the people. So everybody's upset. Now, now what, I, what I want you to miss is this, 
this reflects a reality in, in our lives. When we come to the place where we really recognize that this one, Jesus, was born into this world as God's Savior King, meaning he not only came through the house and lineage of David and had, was a, a rightful heir to the throne of Israel, but being born of a virgin, supernaturally conceived by the Holy Spirit, he was born as the divine Savior King, laying right to the throne of the universe, and that includes the throne of your life and my life. When a person comes head to head with that, when they really comes to grips with that, you understand the rub. Because you see, most of us don't like that. I mean, let's just be honest. We, we want to call the shots in our lives, right? We, we want to run the show. We don't want anybody telling us what to do. We want to be able to make our own decisions. We want to set the course of our own life. This is natural. It is, it, it, it's part of who we are in the flesh for every single one of us. And consequently, when Jesus shows up, and it becomes clear that he is claiming to be the rightful heir to the throne of our lives, that's, that's a rub. It creates friction. And so there is this attitude of being threatened by him. That was, that was certainly, that was certainly Herod's, Herod's attitude, as it is with ours when we realize this rub. It's a threat. It's a threat to our independence. It's a threat to our self-sufficiency. It is a threat to our kingship over our lives. We're threatened by Jesus. But listen, attitude always leads to action. It did in Herod's life. Not only was he threatened by Jesus, he became hostile toward him. And I just want to say to you by way of application, that's where this leads in your life and my life if it goes unaddressed. If the attitude of being threatened by Jesus, that, that feeling of being threatened by him isn't addressed and addressed rightly, ultimately it will play out this way, the same way it did in Herod's life and that with, is with hostility toward Jesus. Here's what it looked like for him. We know in verses 7 and 8, he goes back to the wise men, and then he sends them on their way, and he says in verse 8, go and search for the child carefully. When you find him, report back to me so I can come and worship him. But the text tells us he wasn't being on the up and up with that, was he? That wasn't his agenda. He really didn't want to worship this child as the rightful heir to the, the throne of the Jews. How do we know that? Well, verse 12 tells us that those wise men were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. Verse 13, we'll study this next week. God appears to Joseph in a dream and tells him to take the child to Egypt and stay there until I tell you, he says, for Herod is about to search for the child and kill him. Now, now, now listen, understand, this was not beyond this guy. This was a guy who executed three of his own children during his reign. He executed his wife. He executed her brother. Shortly before his death, he had leading citizens in Jerusalem arrested with the sentence that they were to be killed as soon as he passed away just to ensure that there would be mourning in Jerusalem over his death. This hostility was not beyond him. But it all grew out of the fact that he was, he was threatened. The throne of his life was threatened. And brothers and sisters, I want you to hear me this morning. I want you to know that this attitude of being threatened by Jesus left unaddressed in our lives will ultimately, given enough time, find its way into hostility toward Jesus and everything he represents. Not a day goes by today that there's not a report of somewhere on the planet of brothers and sisters in Christ who are being killed for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There are groups like ISIS who have as their stated agenda to eradicate Christianity. And while the physical persecution hasn't found its way all the way to our shores, please understand, it's coming. 
It is coming to America. Who would have thought 20 or 30 years ago there would be as many people as there are in the United States who are intimidated and offended by a manger scene? That are offended by a cross? That are offended and intimidated by any representation of Christianity? I think I'm 60 years old, so I know I'm on the back side of this, and many of you are on the front side, but I, I've said it to you before. I'll say it again because I want you to get ready. I want you to be prepared. Those of you that are believers in Jesus Christ, I believe in my lifetime there are preachers that will go to jail being accused of hate speech simply for preaching the Bible. There are Christians who will go to jail and maybe worse for confessing publicly the Lord Jesus Christ. It's coming our way, and it's coming our way not because of politics. Please understand that. It's not because of politics, it's because of this. It's because that when people realize that Jesus is not just a Christmas carol, he's not a babe in a manger, but he is the Savior King of the universe who has come to lay claim to what is rightfully is, and that is the throne of the life of every person. When they realize that, there's going to be rub, and many are going to let the threat turn to hostility, all is a manifestation of their rejection of Jesus. That's the first response. There's a second one. And it's really important for us to get this because probably in a context like this, the majority of us, even if, even if you've not yet become a Christian, you've not yet said to Jesus, probably the majority of us in a context like this would say, well, I, I don't reject Jesus. I'm certainly not hostile toward him. Here's response number two. Religion without Jesus. Religion without Jesus. Now, let me be clear to say that this is equally as much rejection of Jesus as the blatant dismissal of who he is and his rightful uh, uh, claim to the throne of our lives. It's just more covert. It's just more subtle. It's more deceptive. You know, religion is not a bad thing in and of itself. Some people think it is. I hear people say, well, I'm not about religion. I'm about a relationship. Well, I think that's a misunderstanding because religion is an amoral thing. It's not what it is. It's what you do with it. It's kind of like politics. You know, politics has kind of a bad name itself, doesn't it? We have a tendency to put it in the category. Well, I don't want to be political. You know, I don't want to be involved in politics. Politics is not a bad thing. It's processes. It's systems. It's, it's you know, it or orders we go through. The process the problem is not with politics. The problem is with the people that sometimes are involved in politics, right? And that's not everybody. There, thank God for some good men and women who are involved in politics out there. But sometimes politics gets a bad name, not because of politics, but because of the people that are involved in it. Same thing is true with religion. Religion's not a bad thing, but what you and I do with it may make it a bad thing. Certainly, that's the case. Here, because here in this passage of Scripture, we have some, we have some guys who, who I think represent these scribes and Pharisees that are mentioned, excuse me, scribes and chief priests that are mentioned in verse 4. They, they represent a religious system gone awry. All right, they, the, 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 the chief priests were over the 24 orders of priests that ruled in the temple. The scribes are the guys that translated the, the scriptures into the language of the people and interpreted to them and, and taught them. Put together, they were looked at as the spiritual leaders of, of the Jewish people. So these wise men show up. And they want to know where the Messiah, the Savior King, is supposed to be born. What does Herod do? Not being fully vested in the Jewish history because he wasn't a, he, because he was a usurper king, he, he calls his scholars together. He calls his, his, his Bible scholars together, and he asks them this question. And in their response and their non-response, 
I think what we see here is a, is a reflection of what happens a lot of times when, when people reject Jesus, but they don't do it blatantly and outwardly. They're doing it deceptively, not just toward others, but toward themselves. Let, let, me, let, me, show you, let me show you what that looks like. I think for these chief priests and scribes, it looks like what it often looks like with some of us when we are rejecting Jesus by embracing a religious system gone awry that is is devoid of the person of Jesus Christ. And that is that, that they know the scripture, but they don't know the savior. Did you notice that? I mean, these guys, they, they really, they, they did, they knew what every good Jew knew. So not something they had to go back and say, every good Jew knew where the Savior King that God prophesied was going to be born. It was going to be Jerusalem. They knew Micah 5.2. These guys didn't even have to say, hey, King Herod, we'll, we'll get back to you on this. Give us a few days to check, trace this down. They knew it. Everybody knew it. Every good Jew knew it. So he's going to be born in Bethlehem. But yet, any, if you know anything about Jewish history, you know that this Savior King was in fact born in Bethlehem, just like the prophet said. And he grew up and he did crazy off the chart supernatural stuff. He healed people. He raised the dead. He cast out demons. He taught with an authority that people could sense was coming from somewhere else. He he did what only God could do, what only Emmanuel could do. He did those things. And yet when it it went right over their heads, right? The people that, that knew the scriptures, they knew their Bibles, they knew prophecy, they knew where it was all headed. And they missed it. And these guys are an icon. Individuals wrapped up in a religious system, leading the pack, Bible scholars, experts in the scriptures. They knew their Bibles, but they missed the one their Bible was intended to move them toward. Not talking about his name. Not talking about just an identity. I'm talking about a relationship embracing him as the one who came to save them from their sins, they missed it. Beloved, let me tell you something. You and I read this familiar Bible story. You know, it's easy to say, well, yeah, gosh, how'd they do this? There's all this evidence here. You know, how'd they miss it? It's easy for us to to look at religions like the ones that were talked about on that video a while ago where people are bowing down to idols and they're burning incense to idols and they're doing, you know, stuff, all this stuff, you know, trying to, trying to, 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 to wring life out of a, you know, of a a wooden statue or a stone. And we look at that and we see, yeah, I I see that. I see how it's religious system, you know, could be there and people involved in it, but they never get to Jesus. But do you understand? Do you understand today? It happens in religious systems like ours. And we can do what we do. And we can be raised like many of us were raised. And we can study the Bible all our lives and we can know the scriptures, we can know the Bible, but never ever get to the one the Bible was intended to lead us to. I'm not talking about knowing his name. That, in fact, leads to another expression that goes hand in hand with it, and that is not only did they know the Scriptures and not the Savior, they had the answers but no affection. I I mean, what, 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 what grips me about this passage is not just what here but what's not here. I mean, I'm one to see if these Bible scholars have been studying. They, they know Micah 5. They know the scriptures. They know where he's to be born. And all of a sudden, these three guys show up in Jerusalem saying, man, we've been following this star, this supernatural manifestation up there, and we've been going after it. And Herod takes that, and he comes back and says, man, look at what these guys are saying. Where is this supposed to happen? I want to see these guys. I want to see this make a difference in their life. Yes, yes, Micah 5, 2. He's going to be born in Jerusalem. Let's go. 
Hey, Herod, would you give us a couple of days off? We want to go down there and at least turn over every stone. We've got to explore this thing because we've been waiting on this guy. We don't find any of that. Oh, Bethlehem, the land of Judea, this is what the passage says. They had the answers, but they didn't have any affection. There was liturgy, but there was no love. There was motions, but there was no meaning. And you understand every one of those things are possible in a Baptist church. You can be raised in a Christian home and be taught the Bible and know the Bible, and you can go through the motions. And when people ask you, a spouse or a mom or dad or a son or daughter, a friend, hey, are you a Christian? You got the answer. Yes, I'm a Christian. You know the terms. You can quote some of the verses. But beloved, there are so many people that check off every box I just checked off, but they have absolutely no affection, no passion for, no drive for, no meaning in that motion, no desire to seek him out and to know him more and to, to exalt him with everything they've got. They know the scriptures, but they don't know the Savior. They know the answers, but they have no affection. And it happens in Baptist churches all the time. And that's one of the reasons that it's important for us to come to this passage Today, understanding this is, this is not just a Bible story, it's a Christmas carol, it's, it's not even just about those religions that are false out there. This kind of deception happens close to home. We can have the answers, no affection. We can know the scriptures and not know the Savior. And when that's the case, beloved, listen, our response to Jesus, even though we may be fooling other peoples, and listen to me, come in here real close, even though we may be fooling ourselves, is no less rejection of Jesus than the guy that says, I'm going to do everything I can to eliminate every hint of this supposed king that's laying claim. No less rejection still rejection. So you got rejection of Jesus, you've got religion without Jesus, both of which are rejection of him. But God in his grace, I think, gives us some expressions in this passage of scripture of what it looks like to, to offer the third response, and that's to revere Jesus and to revere him with a life of worship. Did you notice the word worship is actually, it's actually mentioned three times in this passage that tells us something and it's, it's pretty big emphasis here. It's actually part of this rub. These wise men show up and they're saying we followed this star in verse two and we've come because we want to worship him. That's the first time that it's mentioned. Second time Herod uses it, but he's not being on the up and up when he says, go find him and come back and tell me so I can worship him. The third time is actually the commentary on what the, the magi, the wise men actually did in verse 11 when they found Jesus, and that is that they, they worshiped him. And, and, and you see, this is the response. This is the response here to, that, I, that I think God desires for your life and my life today. And it's represented in, in these wise men. Now listen, I'm not making any call on all of their spiritual condition. There's so much we don't know about these guys. I mean, they're counselors, they king makers of, you know, of countries that probably worshiped other gods, no doubt. They, they, they were experts in the celestial sciences and part of that, you know, things that we probably are, you know, most of us are a little uncomfortable with. And so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to say, look at these good Christians here. I, I am saying in God's grace, in sovereignly orchestrating the Christmas story and the arrival of Jesus chose to put in the picture some guys that responded to Jesus differently than Herod did and differently than the chief priest and the scribes did. 
So that's where these wise men come in. I think they come in as, as a picture of what it means to respond to Jesus the way he wants us to, to respond to him as the one who is God's Savior King and the only one worthy of our worship. You say, what does it look like? Well, let me show you what it looked like in their lives. And, and, I, and I would just say it, it, it's supposed to look like this in our lives as well. First of all, they diligently sought after him. And that's what we do, I think, when we, we respond to Jesus with a life of worship. You know, we're, Matthew doesn't camp out in his introduction of these guys in, in verse 1. It's just almost in passing. It says they, they showed up from the east knocking on Herod's door. We know, as I said, in history, some things we don't know a lot. We do know that they seem to be counselors to royalty, and, and they were in really important positions and used sometimes to, you know, kind of lead the process of the official anointing or establishment of the kings. And as I said, obviously put a lot of stock in the celestial sciences. And so, but they were, you know, they, they were important people. And, and here, these individuals uh, we're introduced to as just showing up on Herod's door. We're told they're from the east. But what we're not told is how far they traveled. East was a long way off. <laughs> the places it would have been referred to as the east. These guys probably tra traveled thousands of miles following that star to come to this place right here. Look in verse 2 in your Bible. Notice where it says they were saying, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? In the language of the New Testament, the verb saying is in a tense that means kind of a, a continual ongoing thing. Herod's door was not the first door they, they knocked on. They'd been knocking on other doors. Hey, you know, where is this? Where is this going to happen? They've been talking in the marketplace. Hey, you know, we've come a long way and know this. They, they, were, they were on the hunt for Jesus. And they were going out of their way. It was costing them a lot of money and a lot of time. They were being diligent in it. And when Herod sends them along their way down there in verse 9, they went their way. And the Bible says, there it was, the star they had seen at its rising. It led, it led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was, until they got to their destination. They were in hot pursuit of Jesus. You know, in my life or your life is a life that responds to Jesus with the reverence of a life of worship. It's characterized by this. And we don't ever stop. It's one of the myths about the cultural Christianity of the South. We, we think it's a journey, a pathway until you get saved. Until you, until you accept Jesus into your heart and then the journey's over, you just need to hunker down and wait for Jesus to come back. Not so much. The life of reverence for Jesus talked about in the New Testament is a life that stays in hot pursuit of him. You, you see, none of us were actually pursuing him when we got saved. <laughs> he was pursuing us in his good grace. But when... When we trust Christ and we become a child of God and we are his child, our life becomes a life of worship in hot pursuit of leveraging everything for him. This is why, brothers and sisters, we read our Bibles every day and we pray every day. It's why we come into places like this and preach sermons like this and get into small groups. It's not so we can go through religious motions. That'll deceive us. It's because we want to do everything we can to pursue him, diligently seek him as the Savior King and the one who has the rightful heir to the throne of our lives. We diligently seek him. Secondly, we gladly rejoice in him. That journey of diligently seeking is always going to play out in, in our affections. Notice in verse 10, when they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Some, some English translations, they rejoiced with great joy. It's not a bad translation. Because in the language of the New Testament, there's just superlatives that are piled on top of one another here. There's just not enough ways to say they, they had joy and they rejoiced and, and they kept rejoicing and they had... Joy, and they just were overwhelmed with joy. Now, let me remind you, joy is not synonymous with happiness. We're not always going to be happy in this world. Joy is, doesn't mean all your problems go away. Joy is that, 
is that peace and that pleasure that we find in Christ that puts our feet on stable ground even when the world has fallen apart around us. And it, and it finds its way into the expression of our worship. And so we rejoice and we articulate it and we talk about it and we sing about it. And it becomes evident that this is what we are as a people of joy because the Savior King of the universe is reigning in our lives. So we diligently seek after him. We gladly rejoice in him. But notice we humbly submit to him. This kind of joy, this kind of affection is always going to play out in physical expression. Verse 11, entering the house, they saw the child with Mary's mother and falling to their knees, they worshiped him. Now, you can't separate those two phrases, falling to their knees and worship. But you know why? Because the word worship actually means to prostrate oneself. That's, that's what's at the root meaning of the word worship. So it reflects getting down on your knees, bowing down, laying flat out, prostrate before the Lord, all of those expressions. That, that's what's at the root of the word worship. And so this passage is not just saying, oh, these guys worship Jesus. It tells us what that looked like. It says they, they fell down on their knees. I don't want to camp here too long, but listen, I, I know the time comes and I realize it more and more that probably some physical expressions of our allegiance to and our adoration for the Lord Jesus or we're, we're, we're physically unable to do, but, but that's not most of our problem. It's not most of our problem in Baptist churches today, and I know it's not just Baptists. You know, I'm, I'm trying to read this. I don't know how many wise men there were. You know, we'd say there are three, but let's just say, okay, let's say there are three. I'm trying, I'm trying to picture, you know, them getting to this place and I said, man, here he is. Here he is. We've been looking for him. And one of the guys saying, yeah, here he is, but you know what? I don't have to bow down on my knees to worship. It's, it's a matter of my heart. You guys go ahead. But yet that, that's what we do today. We, we convince ourselves that, that it's just an affection. It's just a heart thing. And therefore, this doesn't have to show up. Men, listen to me. Can I be honest with you? It's us most of the time. Yeah, I know women are more emotional creatures and they have a tendency to show emotion more. And, and, but, but listen, hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, and that is when you discover that Jesus is your Savior King. He did what the Bible says he did. He is who the Bible says he, uh, he is. Then, then our affection, then our passion for him, and our love for him, and our allegiance to him is going to show up somehow, sometime, in our worship of him. This is why we acknowledge that the Bible talks about raising our hands, clapping our hands, rejoicing with the expressions on our face, bowing low, getting on our knees. Beloved, this, this is what we do when we respond to Jesus as the Savior King of our lives. We humbly submit to him. And listen, those point in time expressions in physical worship actually just pave the way for every moment of every day when we walk in obedience to him, right? When we are living for him according to his morals, his ethic, his holiness, his godliness. And it's showing up, as Paul said in Romans chapter 12, as a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto him, which is our reasonable worship, Paul says, the way we live our lives. And finally, we sacrificially give to him. That's what they did. Verse 11, they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold. Gold, obviously, is the universal expression of wealth. So they had that and they gave him 
or wealth. Frankincense and myrrh, those are the two substances, incense, perfumes, elements that most often were reserved for royalty. Physical expression, they sacrificed of what they had because of who he is. This is why, beloved, I, I don't want you to hear every time, you know, we talk about money. We have a special offering, Harvest Day, or Global Missions offerings, the IMB right now, or even when we talk about our week-by-week -week giving. I, I don't want you to ever see that as just something that's part of a religious system and it's a routine we go through. I want you to think about this. Because you see, this is why we do that. This is what compels us to make sacrifices of our material wealth, our material possessions. It's because it is one, not the only one, but it is one expression. And even if it never went to put missionaries on the field or resource the budget or provide children's programs or pay for buildings like this for us to do stuff like this in, even if it never did any of this, it would still be an expression of worship. But the Bible puts those together for us. God in his sovereign grace gives us the opportunity to do that, to give of our physical possessions and to do it to resource advancing his glory and his name among the nations. This is what we do when we respond to him with reverence for him. Where are you today? How are you responding? What's your response today? Those of you that may be here in this room or watching online, if you're honest enough to say, you know what, I'm, I reject him. I don't believe in him or I believe in him. I just don't care. Please know. Please know that doesn't change the reality of the biblical testimony that he is God's Savior King, which means he's the divine king and he is the eternal king and he is going to reign in all eternity. And he will reign in a kingdom with all of his subjects, all of those who have said yes to him, who have aligned their, themselves with their legion, but those who've rejected him in this world, the Bible is clear to say, will spend eternity separated from his kingdom in a devil's hell. Your decision in this life has eternal consequences. If you, if you find yourself at a place, you say, well, you know, I, I don't think I reject him, but... But you know in your heart of hearts that you go through religious motions, but you don't know the Savior. You don't have any affection for him, no passion for him, no love for him, no pursuit of him. Beloved, please understand today that your, your response is no less rejection. And if you find yourself in either of those groups today, I appeal to you, I appeal to you to the third response. And that is that today, today, you would revere Jesus by acknowledging him as your savior king and surrendering your life to him, trusting him to do for you what you can't do for yourself. Trusting him to be the one who died for your sins and rose from the dead to give you back God's life and to reign forever on the throne of your lives. Acknowledge that today. Find a quiet place in your heart, maybe before you walk out of this room or turn this program off. And in your own words, tell him. You're trusting him. You're embracing him. You're receiving him. You're surrendering to him as your Savior King.